What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, you know, some past episodes, Edo, I think people should check out. Um, I've been doing this uh, Israel business series, and some of the people are just amazing. Uh, Moise Navon uh, of Mobileye, he talked about mm-hmm. Mobileye and their journey being acquired yeah. by Intel for $15.3 billion. Um, it had a lot of ups and downs, and he shares some of the, the downs as well as the ups there. Um, some of the other interviews, um, Jonathan Medved of our crowd, Yuri Adoni, who wrote The Unstoppable Startup, um, Ellie Wortman of Pico Venture Partners, just some amazing stories in that. So everyone check out those episodes for sure and many more. And before I introduce today's guest, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. Um, At Rise25, I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. We help uh, businesses connect to their best relationships, um, uh, their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And we help you run your podcast. Um, And, you know, for me, Ido, relationships is the number one thing in my life. So I'm always looking at a way to profile and give to my best relationships. And I do that by allowing people to talk about their thought leadership and their company through the podcast and sharing with others. So if you've thought as a company, um, we should be doing podcasting and producing lots of content and connecting with amazing people and authorities in your space, email us, check out rise25.com and email us at support at rise25media.com. We've, I've been podcasting since 2008, um, before people knew what a podcast was a lot of people. Um, so today's guest, I'm excited to introduce you a big, Thank you to Shom Levy of Creativity Value, where they help Israeli tech companies. Um, he introduced me to today's guest. And uh, Ido Safrudi, uh, he's co-founder and CTO of Perimeter X. And that was started in 2014. Perimeter X, this is very fitting. I think, you know, si- security is an Israeli cybersecurity company. Uh, I want Israeli security. Uh, you know, like you basically have to ward off a lot of uh, people and attacks in general as a country. And um, especially there's a lot of cyber attacks right now with so much stuff going on in e-commerce, but they can detect and stop automated threats and help to block malicious code. They have Perimeter uh, X bot defender. They have a code defender and their products accurately protects commerce, media, and enterprise websites from all types of automated or non-human attacks at any scale. It also can protect sites from infected code that could leak personal information. They've helped some of the largest brands in the world, including Zillow, Build.com, Skechers, Godiva, and many more. Ido, thanks for joining me. Great being here. So I want to start off with, um, you know, one of these we'll go back to your roots, you know, which is the Israeli defense forces, prime minister office. Um, but I wanted to start off with, um, like a Zillow. Um, how did you first start working with Zillow? Like many cases, it's, I, I can't even trace the initial link. Probably some friend VC or someone, uh, with a customer, they had, uh, in, in, when, when they started, and they're one of our oldest customers. They started by doing things repeatedly themselves, trying to fight all kind of fraud. Uh, initially, I think it was common fraud, uh, them being a marketplace, uh, comments and, uh, or a directory service for a lot of inventory um, <clears throat> agents or other could have used comment to to boost their, their thing, but also there is just uh, fit, like phishing. So people will put comments with link that will uh, moralize that. And like spam the site that, or something. Yeah, like that. spam the site, exactly. Uh, and that tarnishes the site uh, score and things like this. Uh, they're fighting it and they were looking for a solution for to fight this because it was mostly automated or that the assumption was that it, would, it is done by someone automatically running and, and doing that. And that what started the engagement, which ended up being something completely different. Like, and this is what I love in this industry. You start 
trying to solve a specific problem. We had it, an engine that will know how to detect humans versus bots. We, we went and, uh, and, and looked at the, the specific use cases, uh, loved the team, technically brilliant, implemented and understood the technology. Um, some of the things that we saw is some of the spam that was upsetting was actually non, non-automated. I mean, sometimes the, it was manual. Have a, people were going a, in. Yeah, you can have workshops of people where it's it's cheap labor, and they can actually manually do that. And we we help defend that. But once we were deployed and looking at their traffic, we identify what bots are doing that they weren't necessarily aware of, or they had it and fighting in other department, and, and show uh, saw a lot of value. And as as we grew with the and uh, with with the customer on looking on how to protect their accounts, how to protect uh, their content from competitive scraping. Obviously, they own a lot of valuable data of, of MLS and, and other data uh, that they don't want competitors to know uh, if they're pricing or doing that. Uh, and, and this is how we started. Yeah. Uh, Who should be using, you know, I, I picture when I think of Zillow, it makes me think of well, what other sites get lots of traffic that probably have to deal yeah. with spam and comments and bots just trying to infiltrate mm-hmm. like Craigslist comes to mind. Like should all of these highly traffic sites be using Perimeter yeah. X? Yeah, so definitely highly traffic sites, but not only highly traffic sites. If, if you're, your business is, if you have a significant amount of business done online, uh, attackers will try to, to find that. I mean, because the way... Criminals or or uh, cyber criminals are, are working. They are trying to look for opportunity. If you are making a lot of money on the site, then probably by them hacking or frauding or managing to do something to your site, they may find their own value. Criminals are working for profit. They are not. It's not this romantic view that we have of this hacker in a hoodie sitting at night in the basement and trying to to hack for the sake of hacking. More and more of them are actually organized companies working uh, in order to do that. Uh, certain countries are allowing that because it's part of their economy. Certain places are, are less organized, but still they're, they're doing it for the sake of revenue. Uh, so if, there is a, if you're doing transactions online, if your, your asset is your content, like Zillow, for instance, or, or if you're a retail store, if you're uh, in travel, if you're a financial institution, anyone who is doing online business that is significant, you can you can be sure that uh, someone is targeting them with bots. Someone will try to inject malicious code into that to to steal data because they can then monetize it. At what you know, what level of business should someone consider Perimeter X? Like, do they have to be doing X number of dollars or having X yeah. number of traffic where it makes sense? Like, what's the yeah. a good criteria of people? Yeah, I think it's a fair point. I mean, if you look at the overall cloud investment, if you're investing more than a few thousand dollars a month for your hosting cost or your for your other investment, and again in retail, if if you're making more than let's say a few millions or tens of millions of, of dollars online from uh, from sales then you you might become a target if you are too small again a mom's pop shops around the corner that is opening a delivery service uh they're less of an interesting target for attackers yeah uh, it is going and, and becoming more commoditized because the attack tools are becoming more commoditized so again it's all about, about of barrier to entry if, if if it costs me x amount of money to operate an attack and there is an there is an upside. The, the, the lower the attack cost, the, the more broadly the, the problem will become. What's some of the craziest stuff you've seen? Oh, um, there are a lot of extremely sophisticated attackers. There are, it's always fun to find them where in the glitches, uh, where they're putting something where you can trace who is doing that. Uh, there is a criminal part. So one one case is uh, MageCard is a big uh, uh, attack tool that or attack method that is being utilized in the last few years. Where uh, what people figured out, what attackers figure out, is instead of hacking into your database to steal data, if I can get some JavaScript code in your website, which 
potentially I don't need to penetrate your entire system. I may find a way to modify a script. The script is running on the client side browser and then will send information to some third party without the site even knowing it because it goes directly from the browser, waits for you to type in your, for instance, credit card information and billing details. Yeah, it's not inside, it. it's not like inside their database, but if I'm on there exactly. buying something, I'm typing it in, they're on exactly. the site, like actually seeing yeah. it. It runs on your browser and send the information directly to the attacker uh, home server where they can collect the information quietly, not interfering with the transaction. So completely the channel of the user using the browser going to the site is completely, seems completely legitimate and yeah. clean. And, and one of the things that we're doing is we're analyzing that. And because we're analyzing how the application behaves, we're analyzing all kinds of anomalies within the application. And we're seeing these kinds of things happening. And one of the attack attacks we found uh, we found some very specific fingerprints in it. Uh, the way they hide their code, the way they encrypt the code so that if you look at it, it won't look suspicious to begin with. And we found a specific engine. Then we were running a search. One cool thing to do is uh, there is an HTTP archive and, and web archive. There, there are a lot of uh, places where you can search in an efficient way the entirety or like the few million largest sites uh, if you want to look, okay, who is using this library or who is, where, where can I find it? And we found a specific, the specific signature of that crypto engine where we found a site using the exact same library that is selling credit cards. <laughs> so we found the attack being spread on several commerce sites where they were silently uh, stealing all the information. Mm. And has your has your work, you know, led to you know, arrests or someone? I, I just picture like you you tell the law enforcement they bust down the door and like take the person away. Has it led to to actually criminal arrests? Because um, you're, I mean, obviously, what you do is you're just yeah. you're trying to like cut it off at the knees before it even starts, like exactly. not even gonna allow it in. But you may go. I'm sure there's companies that call you mm -hmm. after they've yes. been. I mean, most people probably get a burglar yeah. alarm after they've been burglarized, right? Yeah. So yeah. you get those calls all the time. I'm sure. Yeah, we, we did ask, and, and part of the things that, for compliance reason and for many other reasons, we're trying to not collect any personal information. So there is a limit to how much can we help the authorities in in tracing that because we don't want to log the data. We don't want to be liable for Anything, any breach of data or, or something like this. Uh, we were called a couple of times uh, to help the authorities in investigating crime when on sites we were protected and attacks that we were protected. Being related to what we're doing or being unrelated just because we log a lot of data. Um, if it led to an arrest or not, I'm not aware. Okay. Uh, we, we do report things, uh, but... Uh, we're not necessarily tracking and we're not being updated what is done. Yeah. No. It's, it, so what other type of attacks? Is there something that consumers can do to protect themselves or it's just at that point, it's just the site needs to be protected? Yeah. So, so there are different types of attacks. I mean, there are attacks that are targeting the, the resource of the site. So you as a consumer are not necessarily impacted. Uh, if a, a account takeover, for instance, when I'm trying to just go use dictionary of users and, and passwords that leaked in previous attacks and, and going and hitting them and figuring out if I can take over accounts. Uh, nothing is impacting directly your browser or your server, but this is definitely something that is then may impact your identity because your identity may be stolen on this site and they may do transaction on your behalf. So just being aware of that. The, the basic thing is use a password manager and don't reuse passwords on different sites because you, you need to assume because it's a fact that a site will be breached and, and user's name and passwords and other personal identifiable information will be breached and, and attackers are using that because the fact is that most users are using the same user and password or the same email password across the entire internet. So if one of them is breached, even if that site will then force you to change the password, you won't change it on all other sites. Using a password manager that automatically stores mm -hmm. and, and create a 
random password for any different site definitely will help you. Take me, you know, inside the mind of a hacker for a second. So like they get that data, then do they go to Amazon and banks to see if they can yeah. log in with the same information? Like what, what is, yeah. have you seen happen? So, so they're, they're much more creative and much more efficient than that. And what we're seeing also is in the dark web and in all their forums, you're seeing special specialization or I, I use many cases, in many cases, refer to that as crime as a service. So just like in the old days, you had, if you wanted to build a website, you had to run your own servers, you had to have a networking expert, you had to build your software, you had to build every module. And now everything is like Lego blocks with cloud. You can spin up servers from Amazon, you have load balancers, you can use open source libraries. If you want to run a commerce platform, you, they're, commerce platforms already, you just need to build your code. The same thing is what is happening in, in crime. So there are this groups or someone specializing in, in getting compute power in that sense. So I distributed malware to millions of machines and now I can rent hours uh, by the hour access or by by access point to run payloads from, from machines which are residential, so are easier to hide. So if I have access to your computer, I can rent access for someone who wants to run things from your computer to do other things. Then you have groups that will build specific payloads. So again, if, if with the example of mage cards, we've seen payloads that were the same payload that was using by different organization, crime organizations, because they bought this engine so now the, the criminal, it's, it's almost like a project manager. You need to come with an idea of how can I monetize something? And then you can buy compute from here. You can buy a library. You can uh, commission someone, someone gets to build access an engine. Yeah. somewhere. And then they're like, oh, we are going to sell it to other criminals who will yeah. do whatever they want on it. Yeah. And, and one, mm -hmm. one, one easy example is if I have an, a username and password of a validated, let's say, Amazon user. I can try and figure out a way of how do I monetize it because it's not, not necessarily trivial. While Amazon stores the credit card on the site, I cannot just go and buy things with it because they will allow it shipping only to the specific location that is already on record. Uh, and without it, I need the credit card information. So maybe I didn't find a way, but maybe someone else found a creative way on how to monetize an account on Amazon. So so you find those users who are going and running campaigns, buying for, let's say, $1,000, a list of a million breached accounts that leaked from one thing, and then build an engine that will mm. test it across thousands of different sites. Because you have a botnet, you can go and, and test this dictionary across many different, thousands of sites, and then come back with a list of, these are the validated accounts that I managed to mm. break into. Then you can go online and sell them. And maybe an Amazon account will be sold for $5 an account and another, uh, and another account will be sold for a dollar because, and this will be the, and there are marketplaces for that. And the, the value there changes based on how much people know how to, to do that. And, and, and this is where you find many creative fraudulent ways. So huh. one, one cool way is, is uh, and this was done a few years ago already, uh, the first case was with uh, the first popular case was with Fitbit, and this is warranty fraud. So while I cannot access your payment information to send me a new device, if I saw I have an account and I saw that you bought a device, I can actually do social engineering for the support. And this is what was done for Fitbit, where people logged into this account and say, "Hey, the device that you sent me is not working. Can you please send me a new one?" but please send it to this address. <laughs> and mm. then sure, I'll, we'll do that. You should ship back the, the old not functioning one and then we'll credit you. We'll hold a charge on the car that you have on file. Obviously the, the criminals did not send anything back. The users were charged and then they complained. So there is a cost of supporting and then getting them the money, the money back and, and Fitbit lost a bunch of money on that. So. So they will find a way to be creative in how to monetize, wow. but there are yeah. very different ways. <laughs> That's amazing. It's this whole underworld. So, you know, for people who don't know, the dark web, 
what is it? What's on there? Okay. Um, so the dark web in a high level, and I'll simplify that and, and, and probably will be then uh, mocked for all the inaccuracies <laughs> when, when you go through and try to simplify. But I'm not, you know, consider someone who's very technical yeah. will probably get on yeah. your case. I am, I am not that is, technical. Yeah. The idea is if I want to hide the identity of the server, uh, the, the entire network, and there are a few good books about it, uh, the Silk Road, on, on the Silk Road and others, where, and, and, and these are, how do you leverage that? But it's, it's originated from the Tor network, uh, which is the Tor stands for the onion routing. Uh, which is originally a cryptographic method to anonymize. If I want to anonymize my identity on the internet, I, there is an IP address. So, you know, as a, you can identify and pinpoint an IP address for, I'm from Comcast in San Francisco and maybe even in that neighborhood. And you want anonymity. Uh, so what they invented is a crypto engine where you go through at least three or four different nodes and each one and, and in, encapsulating like an onion, the layer. So I have the message, the original message in it and encrypting it in four different tiers, which are going over the network so that each node knows only who talked to it and who, who it is sending it to, but it doesn't know who originated and where it is destined, where, what is the destination. So I can then browse access servers. I can use Tor to access their regular network. But then I can also, the, the flip side is I can also now put as connect a server to that and publish a server in a hidden way uh, in some, some way of a, uh, if I, so you don't, you, the, the police cannot come and find where the server is because it's anonymized. The people there, uh, it's like, yeah. there's crime going on there, right? I mean, what's- yeah. so, so it started again by purists. Not everyone who is there is criminal. There are all there are many people who just care for their privacy, and they want to do that. But obviously, when you put an anonymized market like this, uh, it is heavily fueled by criminals. I mean, or things that are not necessarily illegal. Uh, it could be just for to avoid taxes, <laughs> but it also could be to you can buy order a murder, you can buy weapons, you can buy drugs, you can. And the same way, you can then hire someone to build a code that will hack into a site or collaborate with people who are trying to do that or figure out, okay, I'm trying to hack to site x.com. Does anyone have a vulnerability or access to it? I'm willing to pay that. Again, this is where the marriage of, of something like the dark web with Bitcoin and other places which anonymizes the source of money uh, created a lot of... Uh, opportunities for criminals not saying that this is the use of that but this anonymity this this is yeah. a, a, it could breed that context. type of yeah, activity exactly. you know what i mean it's exactly. it's a breed it could be a breeding ground right yeah so how, before bitcoin how are people paying for stuff like that because obviously i could see the dark webs making people anonymous yeah which makes them so they aren't yeah. caught as easy but but yeah. they had to pay the people i imagine so before that again before that uh, dark web and, and, and these kind of forums were mostly used by hackers to collaborate and not necessarily directly to pay. So they would coordinate things, they would share hacks and and, and vulnerabilities or, or do things like this in an anonymous way. And some of them, again, also uh, what is called white hats, hackers that wanted to share and collaborate, but do it anonymously for the sake of improving well, but obviously criminal as well. What? Well, why did you start this company? What was the idea behind the company in 2014? So both uh, Omri, who is the CEO, uh, and I came from uh, Akamai through an acquisition of Katendo. And we both share a somewhat similar background in both a uh, major part of our Foundation was security, but then also building a lot of large web infrastructure. Um, Akamai being a CDN, or the company that Akamai acquired, Katendo that we're part of the leadership team at, uh, built a CDN, a modern CDN. 
So the, the, where security meets uh, web infrastructure and especially web scale was something that was very interesting for us and, and something that we were dealing with most of our career. And we saw a need and an opportunity in the way that we felt like the way security is being done on web scale was wrong. Uh, it was sort of forcing almost as an afterthought uh, enterprise security on web, which is a very different architecture instead of rethinking on how should security be there. Uh, traditional security is usually let's put a gateway at the entrance to the data center or to my office and let's force everything to go through that. And that gateway can monitor any request and decide what goes in, what goes out and apply policies on it. When you look at the web, there is no one data center. You're, and especially with the the legal the, the Lego blocks or the the many modules on how you build a modern application. I can use platform as a service. I can use serverless. I can use a payment vendor like Stripe for my payment. So, and a, a modern web application is built from sometimes tens of different sources, and, and you don't have one choke point where you can say, okay, I'll put a gateway here or I'll force everything through that. And most of the security, uh, web security models were saying, okay, let's route everything through one mm. node. Let's put it in the cloud, but it's still, let's force this architecture. And we felt it's wrong. Uh, and mm. we wanted to see, can we do something different? Uh, and Because people are using some... all these tools on their site. And if there's a breach, there's a breach, right? So if they're yeah. using Stripe or this plugin or, or exactly. this, or something else, it's like there's all of these entry points, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and, and even your own application, you may have uh, a database served from here and a, a storage and, and you may run the user authentication in one place and, and the inventory of your items in another place. So how do you secure all that and how do you manage all that? That's and, why you can take the big And how do you do box. that without adding yeah. a little, yeah, and how do you not force and limit the innovation of engineers because the, the reason the things are built this way is because engineers want to move fast. I don't want to rewrite something. So if there is a component that someone provides somewhere there, I'll try to use it. Uh, and what we came is with an architecture that is different, that instead of forcing a, a proxy or, or a model like this, we said, what if we can put open source or modules, components, all over to enhance the existing infrastructure of the customer from things that are running on the client side to collect information from the end user on, on their behavior and their application uh, through integrations to CDN, load balancers, web application and, and application code and put a lightweight uh, shim there that then delivers all the information to our cloud infrastructure, which is out of band where we're doing all the analysis. Uh, and then we're both collecting information and then can instruct the infrastructure and make the infrastructure smarter by also being able to intervene. And we came with this concept. We didn't think of bots. We didn't think of client side. These, these were examples. And then we started interviewing probably 50 different prospects, uh, different customers from different verticals to say, hey, we have this crazy idea. What do you think about it? Is it something that interests that, that you're interested in, what problems would you want to solve with this kind of things? Here are a few problems that we thought are interesting. Are there are these problems that you're seeing? Are these problems that you already figured out in another way? And we got a very, very strong validation to the concept. Um, and this is a beautiful thing that, again, as a founder, you learn is when you come with questions and you're not trying to sell anything, because again, at that point, we didn't have a product to sell. We had an idea. People are, especially here in the Valley, and, and same thing uh, I know with uh, uh, companies in Israel, and I guess this is true across the world. People are very happy to share and to listen because here is a smart person potentially with an interesting idea. I'm happy to share. I'm not committing to anything. So we got really great um, feedback and intros, and some of them became customers and design partners down the road. And after we've seen this 50 different use cases, we narrowed in, narrowed in on two things. One is the model is solid and, and we, we, we got convinced that we as three founders can 
want to invest a big portion of our life in building that. And the other thing is that the first use case for that would be, um, um, the first use case for that would be bot mitigation because this was a problem that we kept hearing customers that, yeah, there are a few vendors that are trying to do that now, but they're not doing it right. They are forcing us to deploy a box in our data center and that will work or they are forcing us to route all the traffic through some, some through their cloud or, and, and they're just not accurate enough. So, so we started with that. So we build the infrastructure and the concept of, of a platform that can do web security in a whole one. And the first few years we're building Bot Defender, which is around detecting bots and, and preventing all these kind of malicious activities. Yeah, I love this. Um, uh, you know, thanks for sharing that. It's like you went, and this is instructive for anyone, right? Mm -hmm. You have 50 potential, pro you have a, the hypothesis, like this is the good idea, yeah. but you, you only know it's a good idea until you have someone who's willing to pay you and get value out of it. So you interviewed 50 people. You asked them the questions to see if it's a big enough, what the problems were and, and mm -hmm. getting validation. And you found there was a big problem that wasn't being solved. And then you guys went out to solve that problem. Um, what do you do from there? Do you try and bootstrap um, with the team? Do you go and raise money? How does, yeah. how, what's the next step? Yeah. So once we got convinced that this is something that we want to build. We, we built some, I wouldn't call it bootstrap. We built a proof concept, mostly to prove to ourselves that also, not only that there is validation from, for the need, but also that the concept and the technology that we're, or the way we're thinking of building it is viable because it required integrating into, currently we have more than 40 different integrations into all kinds of infrastructure. Uh, so we wanted to see that this is viable. And once we had that, we, we went and raised money. Uh, we, um, yeah, we decided to go and raise money. We did a seed, a seed round. Um, funny enough, the first uh, call, the first person we wanted to present with was a friend uh, who was an advisor in a pre, he was in the advisory board of Catendo. Uh, and I knew him uh, from previous uh, roles he had uh, he was the VP of technical operations at Facebook who helped scale them at that. So really knew that. And, and it was more of, we have an idea, we build an initial deck, we want your feedback on it. Uh, his name is Jonathan Heidegger and he ended up being the first investor. Uh, but what we didn't know is he was in a VC, he was trying to build his own VC and, and one of the first feedback was, okay, that looks really interesting. I'm working on something, so I would want to invest, uh, uh, but I'm building my fund as we're speaking, so I don't want to slow you down. I'll make some interest to other VCs that I think may be interesting, uh, and let's see if I manage to get in and at what capacity. And so it was great of him to make a bunch of intros, and that helped get uh, the, the first investors, but also uh, he ended up unintentionally being the, the, invent, the investor instead of just uh, advising. It, it wasn't as easy as, as it can sound. It's not that within the, a week from starting, we closed it. There were some, it, it took us some, probably a couple of months uh, overall um, with the lots of ups, ups and downs, but, uh, but this is how it Early so. on, uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. when raising money, how do you know how much that you need to raise at the time? It's a tricky question. I mean, you you basically raise as much as you can uh, at the right direction. So I guess you don't want to give too much of your company at that point. Yeah. You want to give probably 20 to 30%, not more than that in the early stage. Uh, and it really also depends on what is the trend in the market. Uh, is the right sum for a seed round now 5 million, 10 million or 2 million? And it changes over the years. So uh, I, I would love to say that there is a, a whole discipline about this is the budget and this is what I need to get to the next milestone. And it's more, of, it's, there is a bit of that. What do we need in order to get to the, the next milestone which is product market fit and, and having a few reference customers. Uh, but also it's about 
what is the market, how much can you raise, which helps you also build a budget. So it, it feeds yeah. each other. I guess then at the time when you, I don't know when you raise, if you had customers at the time, but early on, it's harder to come up with a valuation, I imagine. So how do you come up with a valuation at the time when it's early on, you don't have as many yeah. customers and, or clients? Yeah. So obviously yeah, in the seed round, you don't, you have zero customers. You have some reference right. people who validate that they like the idea. Uh, so it's really basically the team, the experience of the team, what is the risk on, have we done things like this in the past? How likely are we to succeed? Um, is the idea in the overall right direction because it may pivot and change two months after you start. Yeah. High uh, risk, so high think, reward, I guess, for those people, Yeah, right? Yeah, and, and in that case, is it like, is a valuation at 10 million or 20 or 50, it's just, Right, exactly. Whatever, yeah. how, how, however convincing you are. I mean, the problem <laughs> might be a a huge problem or a small problem. It's it's more about the team and, and your ability to yeah. execute that. I think later on it becomes uh, more of an art, and probably I, I know you you are interviewing also VCs and and all that. So I guess they have their own method of how to estimate or how to evaluate uh, a company, but. At the end of the day, it's also a supply and demand. If, if you manage to get a few VCs interested, you can open a bidding war. If you don't, then you're stuck to what you are. Talk about early on, Ido, um, some of the lessons you learned and um, maybe any interesting stories from Israeli Defense Forces and Prime Minister's Office. Those days. So lessons I've learned... I think it's about, again, even though I love technology and the CTO owning product and engineering in our company, I mean, technology is rarely the, the driver. I mean, technology is an enabler to solve a problem. The main focus should be always on what problem are you solving? Who is the customer? And explaining that because once you know that using technology to solve it is sort of the easy part. <laughs> um, and so focusing a lot of that, focusing on what not to do were things that even in, again, as part of my military service, um, you need to focus on what it is that you do, what will get you the most reward, what will get you the, the highest value for the customer. Uh, so this is a, an extremely valuable lesson. The other thing is, and this is one of the best advice I got is to hire early and to hire for where you want to go. One of the biggest mistakes is that people are hiring for the needs they have now, especially in a startup that you plan to grow fast. So, oh, today I have an engineering team of five engineers. I need just a team leader that will manage five engineering instead of hiring. No, I need the VP of engineering that will help make lead these five people and build a 50 engineer team because I don't want to swap heads every year. I don't want to hire people uh, and I want to help people scale. So if you think you may need marketing at a certain point, hire them. And, and, in, and, and again, it's, it's a great lesson I took and it's a great, uh, I can say that I'm practicing it as, as, as well as I, I am to. Uh, and one of the feedbacks and one of the comments we, we got, and this is true for our team, we're extremely frugal and we're trying to be very efficient, which was very good. It helped us get to where we are, but in some cases, and I think this is the main regrets I had on, on almost the, the, the actions I did is uh, there are many things that I could have done earlier. I could have hired specific people earlier. I could have hire a person for a later stage where it sounds wasteful or what will this person do? I mean, he used to manage a hundred people and now I have a team of 10, but if the challenge is big enough and if the division and all that, and you have such a person, then, then you will get there. What's some of the advice you got from a mentor or some of your investors that has proved to help 
in addition to that? Because yeah. I'm sure you get a lot of feedback from them as well. Yeah. So this one was definitely one um, fire fast. <laughs> hmm. um, again, more about people. Um, if something feels, especially in a small organization, when you're in the growth, if you're thinking if someone is is good, usually it means that it is not. If you're thinking about should this person, should I fire this person or not? Probably you should. Uh, I had only two cases, I think, in my career when I thought I should have fired a person and eventually I learned that I was mistaken. And in both cases, it was after going through a process of a hearing or going and, and, and talking to the person and being very straight and, and being very direct. So I think aiming with, with clear goals, clear feedback, uh, even, if, even if it's harsh and it's less of a pleasant because, uh, environment because you don't only recognize that. Um, but this is definitely something that that is extremely important. And and the third thing, which is again all all around people, it's hire early, fire fast if if it's wrong, and then also don't be just strict. I mean, recognize. Uh, and this is something that I'm con- continuously learning to do better: is how do I reward people? How do I recognize the good things? Because it's very easy when you build something to constantly look at what's not working well. What, what can I do better? Uh, instead of looking back and say, okay, what we did is quite significant or both for, for ourselves, but also for team members. Uh, and they appreciate the criticism and they appreciate the strive for perfection and how can we do things better. But a tap on the shoulder every once in a while and recognizing that what you did is great is for someone is, is extremely valuable and you can never do it. No. Yeah. You know, um, what has been a hard decision you had to make when you were in the military? Um, so one of the hardest decisions was to leave the military hmm. um, because you're, you're doing it and you're doing it for a long period of time. And I've, served for about nine years uh it's you're doing it because you believe that you're doing something that is serving a greater greater purpose it's not just for the the money or it's not just for the the drill um so i think that was one of the hardest decisions um there are ultimately why did you that was nine years it's a long time yeah, um, that might be one of the criticism I had in my period on on the military organization. And, but then they, the military is run by military men and fighters at the head, the, at the head of the army or the head of any organization. Usually you don't have a technologist or a businessman at the top. It's someone who started in the Marines or the Navy or, or infantry or something like this in special units. Uh, so there is sort of a glass ceiling for technologies or for people who can inf- impact, where in tech, it's the opposite. Uh, so when you grow and when you start becoming, uh, getting a, more senior roles in the, in the military and intelligence and all that, you get more responsibilities, but also politics becomes heavier, like in any large organization. And this is where, at what point do you stop enjoying uh, your day-to-day job, mm. even though you see the greatest, the greater cause. Yeah. And this is where I, I felt, okay, I, it was I really enjoyed, I want to leave in a good point and not when it's sour. You know, first of all, thank you. I have one last question, but I really appreciate you sharing your journey, your expertise. Um, um, And everyone should check out perimeterx.com. If you know of any of these type of uh, companies or brands that 
you know, are taking a lot of transactions online or have a lot of web traffic, tell them to check out perimeterx.com. And, you know, now more important than ever with COVID, like everyone, like there's so many people just on the internet. I mean, even if you see early on, you know, like the, the issue Zoom was having because of the explosive growth. Yeah. I mean, you just see security measures after security, me- like patching on, on Zoom. Yeah. And this is happening across um, all the, all the business, that's just one that we probably use. And we see, like, I log in and it's like, all of a sudden I have to like allow people in because they're putting in these security measures mm-hmm. and, and some of the stuff we see, some of it we don't. So check out perimeterx.com. Um, you know, my last question, um, you know, is, um, you know, you, um, were in Israel for a long time. Now you've been in the U S for a long time. What are some of the differences you see, either it's conducting business or culturally um, Israel compared to the U S and then when we're talking U S you are in San Francisco. So it's like, yeah. you know, obviously you're, you're yeah. from that lens, but what are some of the differences you see between life in Israel and life in the U S? Yeah. I think one of the, uh, the main reason I moved to the U S is to be close to the market. Israel is a very small market. Most of the startups and companies that are built in Israel are selling to other markets, not built to serve the local market. Um, uh, so the main difference when I moved was feeling, okay, now I understand so many things in a different way. Uh, it's, it's more so in consumer web than in, in B2B, which is the business I'm at. But feeling, okay, this is where the market is targeting. This is like having Amazon delivery, having Netflix working, having a bunch of of things where the target markets are and and understanding the consumer and understanding that business is done differently. Uh, People are much more direct and rough in Israel in a much more uh, direct. And and I must say that in the startup world, specifically in Silicon Valley, it's closer to that than in, I guess, in the Midwest. Uh, where people are a little more tame, um, but it's it's very different. I think people are much. Uh, one one obvious thing is personal life and and the barriers in workplace. The difference between uh, in Israel, the work is where you get most of your close friends. Uh, where here there is a much clearer separation of your private life and your work life. Uh, and that especially now when running a large U.S. office and large Israeli office, how do you make sure that there is one culture overall while you don't expect people to really have one culture? I mean, you, you want to acknowledge and, and, and identify these differences. Um, yeah, there are, there are actually a bunch of books and, and, and recommendations on how different the culture is, but I think these are some some obvious ones. Again, one simple example on, on personal life is the first answer when I, and, and I was shocked after living for six years in the US when I started interviewing for employees in Israel because while we live in the US, our first hires, we decided to hire and build our engineering and excellence center in, in Tel Aviv. Uh, so interviewing candidates and the first thing they're saying, I'm 28, married with two kids. And these are all things that no one will say in the U.S. in an interview, especially not starting with that when you're asking, tell me about yourself. And for me, it was like, why are you telling all that information to me? Because I was already spoiled and by living for six years in the U.S. And, and, and I think this is, tells about. Uh, why, do they, about why do they start with that in Israel? This is Just how because. you start, because this is what you put in your CV. And people are very open about that. People are telling their age, mm. marital situation, where they live, what the they U.S. Do, is more of a hobbies. divide that just shows the yeah. divide between the personal and the business. Yeah. And Israel took yeah. all kind of one thing. I got yeah. you. First of all, you know, thank you, everyone. Check out perimeterx.com. Check out more episodes of the podcast and Rise Twenty Five. And thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a.
beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.